Well, it is communion time. So I pray you have your juice and crackers ready. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 11. And I'll begin with verse 23, and you can follow along. 1 Corinthians 11, 23, as we begin communion. Verse 23 says, For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me in the same manner. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, the scripture says two things, as often and in remembrance of me. So, addressing the as often. Uh, as often, in verse 26, even brings that up as well. For as often as you eat, as often as you drink. How often do we do it? As often as you choose. Once a month, once a week, every day, it doesn't matter. Know this, that we are remembering. We are remembering him. Now, the only way that you can remember him is if you know him. If you don't know him, you can't remember him. I don't, I don't mean you've heard of him or, or you know the name. I mean, you're in relationship with him. That is how we remember him. The way we are in relationship with him is by confessing him as Savior and Lord. Believing in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead. If you have prayed the prayer of salvation or, or what's known as the sinner's prayer. Uh, and neither of those are in scripture, but it's based on uh, evangelistic and salvation scriptures like Romans 10, 9 and 10. So if you have done that, then you are in the family of God and therefore you are qualified to remember him. If you, once again, if you've never been saved, regardless of age, then you should wait this one out. There is, there will be an opportunity for you to enter into the family of God. Until then, you should, uh, you should sit on the sidelines and, and, and observe. And maybe even in that observation, it'll be inspiration for you uh, to want to become a part of the church. Verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Until he comes. We're proclaiming his death until he comes. So the scripture establishes that he indeed died, but death could not hold him down. Death could not keep him because who else can we say this about proclaiming one's death until they come? If they're dead, how can they come following their death? But our Messiah is alive, alive forevermore. Verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be what? Guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. This is the first of two times Paul brings up the unworthy manner. Now he's writing to Christians. So clearly there is, there is some way in which we as believers can eat and drink in an unworthy manner. For the Corinthian church, it had to do with their divisions, their favoritism, uh, the factions and groups in the church that were being mean and cruel to others, that were neglecting others. That is an example, clearly the primary example of an unworthy manner. And it is easy for believers to fall into that if we're not careful, if we're not led of our born again spirit as opposed to our unregenerate flesh. So he says in an unworthy manner, they will be what? Guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, of the body and the blood the body and the blood, guilty of it as a result of eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. So Paul sets Corinthians or the Corinthian believers straight before they partake at the table. And so he says in verse 28, he says, but let a man do this, let a man examine himself and so let him eat or then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So I can avoid that unworthy manner by examining myself. How can I examine myself? myself or according to what do I examine myself? And we have the manual right in front of us. We examine ourselves according to God's word. Verse 29, he brings it up again. But he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner does what now? Eats and drinks judgment to himself. 
So first it's being guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, now we're eating and drinking judgment to ourselves if we eat and drink in the unworthy manner. So it's not God's looking to judge us. Judgment is already out there. Uh, and any violation of God's prohibition or command exposes me to that judgment. And I can avoid that by doing what? By eating and drinking in, an, in a worthy manner. I can also avoid being guilty of the body and blood of the Lord by eating and drinking in a worthy manner. Our, once again, our best example is what Paul addresses to the Corinthian church. So if we would just do the opposite, if we would do the opposite, and some of the things that he, that he mentions is, he says, uh, you come together not for the better, but for the worse. So how about we come together for the better? He says, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. How about there be no divisions among us? How about there be no factions among us that we approve of some and, and, and disapprove of others? Uh, how about we all eat together, right? Not favor those first, because remember in this day, it was a meal. So there were those that were being neglected from partaking in the meal. There were those chosen before others. That shouldn't have been the case. Let that not be the case in the church today. So those are the things that he had to address. Once he addressed them, he says, all right, now that's how you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That's how you eat and drink judgment to yourself. Let's do the opposite of what the Corinthian church did. In that latter part of the 29th verse, he then says this, not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body for this reason. Which reason? Not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason. Which reason? not discerning the Lord's body because they didn't discern the Lord's body or one does not discern the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak, sick among you, many sleep. For this reason. Now, who is the Lord's body or what is the Lord's body? The glorified body of our Lord is at the right hand of the Father where he's making intercession for the saints. But he told his church, go into the world. That was a transfer of authority. Paul, in this same epistle to the Corinthian church in the next chapter, he's going to let them know. And by letting them know, he's letting us know, you are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. So when you look at how Paul had to correct these Corinthian believers because of how they were treating each other, that means they were treating the body of of Christ in a way that doesn't line up with Christ, in a way that doesn't line up with the head, not discerning the Lord's body. But I also need to recognize that when I'm eating uh, the, the, the bread and drinking the cup, I, I'm not really eating the flesh of Messiah. I'm not drinking his blood. These are elements that are symbolic. Uh, once again, he's at the right hand of the Father in a glorified body, flesh and bones, the scripture says. So, for this reason, not discerning the Lord's body, many are weak, sick among you, many sleep. What happens if we do discern the Lord's body? I believe verse 30 would read this way. For this reason, many are strong. Many are healthy among us, and many live prolonged lives. They don't sleep. They don't die prematurely. Think about what Paul says. Many, not some, not a few, not a little. He says many, simply because they're not discerning the Lord's body. Is it possible? That that one thing that needs to occur for us to experience the manifestation of whatever it is we're believing God for, especially healing, especially healing, is by discerning the Lord's body, by treating ourselves and our fellow believers according to the word. Verse 31, if we would judge ourselves, just like let a man examine himself, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, not if. But when, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. The scripture says when, because I'm a perfect spirit, I have a soul that's being perfected, but I'm housed in a body that will be perfected until that day of redemption for my body. I'm living in sinful flesh. And because of that sinful flesh, constantly Waging war against my born again spirit, there is a tussle, a tug of war, a struggle. And sometimes as believers who wholeheartedly love God, we love Messiah. We're filled with the spirit, but we drop the ball. We miss the mark because of that, that, that 
imperfect flesh that we live in, which is why Paul says when we're judged, not if, not if, but when, when we're judged, we're chastened by the Lord. He's talking about the church. We're chastened by the Lord. The world has a different judgment than our judgment. I prefer the chastening of the Lord. I'd rather be on, on that side of the judgment of God than the other side. He says that we may not be condemned with the world. And remember what John 3, uh, 15 through 18 say. He who does not believe is condemned already. When we're born into this world, we're born into sin and born into condemnation. That's why we must be born again. Verse 33. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Why does he say wait for one another? Once again, remember the setting. The setting was back in these days, it, it was a meal, right? Not, not the, the little crackers and the shot of juice that we uh, uh, partake of for what we call communion today. No, it was an actual meal. And there were those that were preferred over others, and that shouldn't have been the case, which is why he says, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But then in this 34th verse, he establishes what it's about or what it's not only about. What it's not only about. He says, if anyone is hungry, well, let him eat at home. Because when we come together, or when they came together in this day, uh, they didn't just come together to eat or to satisfy hunger. It wasn't about that. That was a byproduct. But the primary was what? Remembering our Messiah, his broken body, and the precious spilled blood of the Lamb of God. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. He says, and the rest I will set in order when I come. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word on communion, your word on remembering our Savior and what he did for us who are a part of his church, even what he did for those who have, or are yet to be a part of the church. I thank you, Father, that uh, we will remember what we heard today. The Holy Spirit has something to bring to our remembrance. We have been reminded faith has come. And so I thank you for this honor and this privilege. We thank you for this honor and privilege to remember you. And we give you all the praise, glory, honor, adoration, and thanksgiving. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.
the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he said, take, eat, this is my body, my body, not bones. <laughs> the prophecy of the psalmist was fulfilled. But he said, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat, you do so in remembrance of me. And so we remember that, we remember that broken body. Uh, that, body was, that body was broken before it even got to the cross. How much more once on the cross? And every sickness, every disease, every stress and anxiety was placed on our Messiah. Most importantly, the sin of the world. So that it would all be rendered inoperative regarding the lives of God's people. So we look back at the altar in which the Lamb of God was slain, the cross, recognizing where he is now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. At some point, he will stand up when his enemies are made his footstool. We also look forward to the day that our King will return. And without a doubt, he will return. I am glad I am on the Lord's side. And I'm sure you are too. Let's eat together. same night in the same manner he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant the new testament in my blood as often as you drink it you do so in remembrance of me symbolic of the spilled blood of the lamb the lamb who takes away the sin of the world this blood that was spilled means I don't have to be subject to sin I don't have to be dominated 
by sin anymore. I don't have to give in to the flesh because I have no control, because it lords over me. No, we're new creatures in Christ, and that's because of this precious blood that was spilled. And in this blood, there is forgiveness. That's what I love about God. Forgiveness wasn't just available to the unbeliever, but even those of us who are in Christ. John said, I write to you, little children, so that you don't sin. He's talking to the church. He says, but if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He says he covers the church. He covers the world. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate, family. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you. Okay, at the beginning of the year, starting in January, and starting on January 3rd, I started a series that I call Personal Growth. And it was about your personal growth as... Hmm? Hmm? I didn't realize you had to be commanded to sit down. No, I'm serious, when the prayer is over, by the way, I don't know if you looked around, two-thirds of the uh, congregation was sitting down. So I thought, I thought those of you standing just wanted to stand. <laughs> That's too much respect, y'all, today. <laughs> As I said, starting in, on January 3rd, I began with a series entitled Happy New You, followed by How Great You Are, and followed by Seeking God, which is followed by practicing Christianity. And then I did a message on take charge of your life, emphasizing that it's your life. And later I did a four part series on focus, the guardian of purpose. Now these messages were designed to help create a better understanding and really deeper awareness of the great spiritual resources we have within each of us as born again believers. You know, in the song that Keith sang earlier during praise and worship, he said that because of what God has done for us, the weak can say we're strong, and the, rich, and the poor can say we're, we're rich. That's absolutely true. When you really understand the glory, the power, and riches that have been deposited within us, which is what I've been talking about in all these series, and especially this latter one on Within the Dependence, you can absolutely say that and stand on it. Uh, if and when used, the unlimited resources that we have deposited in us empower us to be capable and competent overcomers in a world that continually presents challenges that we must overcome. Now, the fact that we can overcome in any challenge is because of the supreme greatness of this power within. 
This is summarized in our foundation scripture today, and that is 1 John 4. And I want you to go to that. Now, I have a lot of scriptures today, and I'm not going to ask you to go to all of them, but this one I want you to go to. 1 John 4, and read it for yourself. When you have it, say, I have it. And at this time, I would like to welcome our viewers via Periscope. We are always happy to have you with us, and we hope that the message will be a blessing to you today. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, unfortunately, many Christians, when faced with a challenge, whether it's physical, financial, relationship, family issue, no matter what, we tend to focus more on how great the challenge is and neglect to really appreciate, understand, and see how great the resources we have. Our resources are greater than any of these challenges. And that's why our foundation scripture tells us this. He that is in us is greater than any of these challenges we face. He in the world includes anything that's in the world. Now, to emphasize this point even more so, a few, a few weeks ago, I added to this personal growth series a message entitled, Within Dependence, to spell out in greater detail how our help in every need is indeed within us. By way of review, the foundation scripture at the beginning of that series was Job 6.13. You don't have to go there, it's a one sentence. In Job 6.13, Job asked the question, is not my help within me? And we answered yes in this series so far. And we answered with a look at a number of scriptures that point to the fact that we have great power and resources and riches within us as born again believers. We just looked at our foundation scripture, 1 John 4.4, 4, which tells us that you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he, uh, he who is in the world. Now, who is he that is in you? It is God and the full Godhead, which you've heard us say so many times from this pulpit. And this power deposited in the within of us is what enables us to overcome any challenge we might ever face in the world. Now, let's look at another familiar scripture. And you might take a look at this, although you know this scripture. It's Ephesians 3.20. 3.20. Ephesians 3.20 reads this way. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, exceedingly abundantly above, all that we ask or think, how? According to the power that works in us. The important thing is that the power is already at work in us. Now, let's look at some of the other components we reviewed uh, at the beginning of this series. Uh, we find in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. You can write it down because you know the scripture. I'm going to read it to you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. But do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. So you know from this scripture that as part of the full Godhead, we also have the Holy Spirit within us, which is another gift from God. Now, the third component of the Godhead, which we know, uh, is referred to by Paul as a great mystery. That third component, of course, is the Son. But Paul speaks of it this way, and this is in First. And that's not first, it's just Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. You can take a look if you want to. Colossians 1, 26, 27. Here, Paul refers to the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. And to them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. That's us, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I, simply, I simplify this by putting it this way. The mystery hidden from ages and generations, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's your hope of glory. 
Now, the fact that the full Godhead is within us is made clear again by what's stated in 1 John 5, 7. And this is another scripture that you know, 1 John 5, 7, which tells us this. That's 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, God, the Word, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, while we know that each can function separately from the other, the sense we get here is that wherever one is, the other two are there also as available power and resources because the three are one. And because we are born again believers, we have a full Godhead within us and we can and should be, as I've been talking on this topic, within dependence because all that power is within us. Now, so exactly what does it mean to be within dependent? It's just my way of saying that we are self-sufficient. When God made us, he designed us to be a complete and self-sufficient being. He did this by putting himself and his powerful resources within us, which endowed us with what I call the radiance of transcendence, the radiance of transcendence. And I asked uh, Ian to put this information on the board. So do you have that, Ian? Probably coming up. The radiance of transcendence. Uh, and that, by the way, is our subtitle today. The topic is within the pen. That subtitle is radiance of transcendence. Uh, we, you and I, are endowed with this radiance of transcendence. This is the best description I could come to or find which describes this unique quality of our being, which I think so few Christians really understand. So let's break it down word by word. Endowed, and I think Ian has that. Can you see that? We have all of them, but he has the meaning. To provide with an ability, quality, or asset that's endowed. The next one is radiant or radiance. To send out rays of light shining or glowing brightly. The next one, transcendent or transcendence. And there are several definitions here, and you'll find this if you look these up. First one is Transcendent means to transcend, which is to surpass, excel, or be extraordinary. In philosophy, A, it means beyond the limits of possible experience, and for that matter, understanding. And B, and I put this in there because you'll find this if you look this up, is Kantianism. It's really Kantianism. Uh, and according to Kant, it's beyond human knowledge. Now, just a quick word, we're not going to get into this. That's from Immanuel Kant, who is the philosopher who founded the school of transcendentalism. And he's saying that it's beyond human knowledge. Third is the theology definition, which means existing apart from the material universe. Apart meaning that you're not dependent on what the material universe has to work with. And said of God. In other words, it's of God. And that's what we have been endowed with, this radiance of transcendence. And, and we'll come back to this. This transcendent quality we have is definitely of God and from God. So to summarize it, uh, let me put it this way. We have been endowed or provided with the ability or quality by God that radiates all around us and from us as a brilliant light that has power to transcend or surpass, exceed, or be greater than anything in or on the material earth because it is God power. This transcendental quality definitely comes from God. We are of God as 1 John 4.4 4 starts with, we are of God. And that is why he that is in us is greater than he that's in the world because God has all the power and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Now, that is what within dependence is and it means self-sufficiency. 
it is important to know that this kind of self-sufficiency is based on God's all-sufficiency and not on our limited ability. And it's based on God's sufficiency that he's provided inside of each of us as born again believers. God created, created us that way and that is one reason we say that we are wonderfully made. You've heard that. In fact, let's go look at that. That's uh, Psalms 139, 13, 14. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. And it says, For you have formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We have been made, as you've been told, to have dominion over all the earth, to reign over all the earth, to be the head and not the tail, and in all things, and you hear this all the time, in all things we are already victorious and we are more than conquerors by the power that works within us. Now our unique design is highlighted in 2 Corinthians 5.17, and I do want you to go to that. 2 Corinthians 5.17. When you have it, say you have it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As I said before, several times, this new creation we become after salvation is much more than a makeover or renovation of our old self because of the spiritual nature and power of God that we receive after salvation we become a new species a distinct new and elevated kind of being God now endows this new creation or new species with the radiance of transcendence that enables us to live with the license of a higher order of being that's an order of being that is not limited by ordinary human ability. Henry Thoreau gave us that phrase, a higher order of being. This new species we, we become is a higher order of being that surpasses the normal ability of man, normal man's knowledge, normal man's understanding. When we become that new creation described in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we take on the attributes of a higher order of beings which surpasses our normal self. The abilities uh, that exceed, as I say, anything that the normal individual might have. This is who we are. That's you and me as born again believers. And it flows from within. Now, I want to read you what Thoreau wrote in his classic book, Walden, about this higher order of being. And keep in mind that Thoreau was not known to be a religious person. I would say he was a spiritual person and he was a deep thinker. But this is what he writes in the conclusion chapter in Walden. He says, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind. He will pass an invisible boundary. New, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him. Or the old laws will be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense. And he will live with the license of a higher order of beings. That's us. And because we are this new species ordained by God, 1 John 4.4 4 can boldly proclaim that we are of God and that we have overcome them because he that is within us is greater than he who is in the world. Now, as I said, God designed us to be this new self-sufficient species and empowered us to be so because our sufficiency is within and it comes from him. This self-sufficiency, as I stated before, is not power or ability that springs from our own limited self. So no one should get a big head. We're not that self-sufficient. Our sufficiency is based on God. And I want you to see this in scripture. Uh, look at uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 5. 
Second Corinthians, you can mark it down. I'm going to go ahead and read it because I want to get through a certain amount of this today. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 5 reads, Now, not now, but not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Now, it's interesting. We're actually in the same position that Jesus said he was in. Because Jesus was entirely dependent on the Father for all his words and all his works. We can learn from the example he set when he said in John 5.19. You can jot it down, John 5.19. If you can get there, you can get there, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. John 5.19. Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, and whatever he does whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like manner. Now you'll find Jesus repeating this several times in Scripture, and we won't look at those, but they're there throughout uh, the four Gospels. The Apostle Paul echoes the same point for himself in Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13. You can jot it down. I'll read it to you. In Philippians 4.13, Paul says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now we say that read it, recite it all the time. But it's important to understand, and we don't always hear this explained, 415 or 413 of Philippians does not mean that we can literally do anything. What does it mean? It means that we can do anything consistent with the will of God, which is contained in his word. And you forget that. In other words, I can't go up to the top of this building and decide that I'm going to fly to the office you know, that's, that's an old thing, but no, that's not, it's, well, let me put, let me, let me put the bottom line. It's not within God's will that we act a fool, <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, unfortunately, <laughs> many Christians and even some pastors misunderstand and misuse scriptures like Philippians 4 to 13 when they espouse the uh, expression that we can do all things through Christ. No, it's all things with the qualifier that's consistent with the Word of God. And I'm just going to mention this because this is probably for someone. They make a mistake in another scripture that we're familiar with. That's Mark 9.23. Mark 9.23. Where Jesus says, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now again, I hear pastors use this to support or advance a proposition that they believe in because if we can believe, all things are possible. But again, the all possible things are things consistent with the will of God. Now as Elder Ivor told us last week, you cannot covet another person's spouse or another person's possessions. That's not in the will of God. In fact, to covet is a violation of one of the uh, Ten Commandments, so forth. So we can't look at this hotel where we're meeting and say, we like this room, so we're going to claim this room for ourselves, and we don't have to pay the hotel any more rent. <laughs> no, we cannot covet the property of the Wyndham Hotel system. We can't. It is not in God's will to do so. So we see evidence throughout scripture, by the way, that our self-sufficiency is based on God's grace and all sufficiency. For example, in dealing with the thorn in his flesh, and you're familiar with Paul's thorn, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12.8, and you can read the whole story in this section of uh, 2 Corinthians, but in 12.8 he says this, 2 Corinthians 12.8, you can jot it down. He says, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. That's the thorn. And in verse 9, and the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And we remember that our salvation, which is the basis for everything, is by grace. Ephesians 2.8 I've given you the scriptures because I want you to recognize that 
for the most part, I don't make any statements up here unless you can find them in the Word. And you can, and you can look them up for yourself, as Apostle says. Check it out for yourself. That's Ephesians 2.8, which tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So as we look at with independence and our self-sufficiency, we must never forget that it's based entirely on God's all-sufficiency, and it empowers us to, great, to do great things, and sometimes supernatural things, sometimes things that we might call miracles, but they're actually regular, ordinary things when we are acting from that power from within. Uh, the uh, self-sufficiency that we are able to employ based on the riches God has deposited within us and the riches of his promises enables us to become partakers of the divine nature with him. And I do want you to look at that scripture. You know the scripture, but turn to 2 Peter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and we've gone over this before. Here we are informed of this. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What's left out of all? All things that pertain to life and godliness. And it doesn't say that here, but he, by the way, has deposited that within us. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And verse 4, by which we have been given which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, this statement in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that his divine nature has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, brings us to the point where we can examine and list in some detail what God has deposited within us that gives us this radiance of transcendence. It's one thing to make these statements. It's one thing to always talk about the Godhead being within us. But I want to actually go over a number of things that emanate from this, uh, all of which permits us to be partakers of God's divine nature. Now, knowing that God has deposited, has deposited himself within us, we can list and summarize some of the power and riches that come with this deposit of the gift that he himself is. Now, as Elder Ivor would say at this point, if you're note takers, this is a good time to take down notes because I'm going to hopefully go over 12 points, uh, and if I don't finish today, we'll finish next week, that come from this God-deposited power within us. Why is he that's within us greater than he who's in the world? You can say, well, it's because it's God. Well, it's true. But we know right off the bat that God is the big three, the big three O's. Omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. You know all three of those words. All-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at the same time. All-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at the same time. Omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. So if he's all this, we, we could stop right here. You don't need anything else to be greater than he that's in the world. You have all of that. Is there anything greater than God that we know and just described? I don't think so. But here are some other things. From God, we are spirit, and you know this. We're made in God's image. And look at, for yourself, look at John 4, 24. You know, we say this all the time, that God is spirit. Some scriptures say God is a spirit, but it's, it's more correct, I think, to say God is spirit. And we're made in, in, in his image and likeness. So we are spirit, that's our true nature. But look at John 4, 24. We know this because Jesus tells us Jesus says in, in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, if anyone should know what God is and is like, it's Jesus, because he was there in the beginning. Go to the Gospel of John, first 
verse and it says, in the beginning, the word was, with, was. Jesus was with God from the beginning, so he knows, he knows. So if God is spirit, then we are made in and of his spirit. We are a tripartite being. You've heard apostles say this all the time, tripartite being, three-part being. We are spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body, but we are spirit. Now, point number three, we are love, made in God's image of love. You don't always hear this, uh, but in, in the next one I'm gonna go to, but we are love. And I want you to see this in the scripture. One John, that's little John, before Revelations. One John 4, 16 states this. One John 4, 16 states this. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So God is love. While you don't always hear this, we are made in and of love because God is love just as we are made in and of spirit because God is spirit. So when you hear someone say, you know, I don't feel very loving. I don't have any love in me. I can't express love. You can tell them that you're mistaken because your very essence is love. You're made in and of love. You have, your whole being is love. There's no way that you can be without love. So, number four, we are light. And you hardly ever hear this one discussed, but I want you to see where it is. And we're made in the image and likeness of God's light. One John, you're in one John, back up a little bit and go to one John, one five. 1 John 1, 5. It says, this is a message which we have heard from him, him being Jesus, and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And just for your information, in the Bible, light is frequently used as a metaphor or symbol of righteousness, understanding, being blameless, being free of all blame, and so forth things like that. So God is light and we're, we're light. Uh, jot down Philippians 2.15. Philippians 2.15 says this, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Sounds like he's talking about today. Among whom you shine among you who shine as lights in the world. Remember in Matthew 5, 14, Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, Elder Iva reminded of this, uh, us of this last week. So we see that our real makeup is a combination of spirit, love and light derived from God. We are a loving spirit full of light. And that's why our foundation scripture 1 John 4, 4 declares that we are of God because we are indeed of God. So continuing, what else do we have from God that is within us? Number five, we have dominion. Genesis 1, 26 not only states that uh, man and, and, and woman was made in God's image and likeness, but God gave them dominion to reign over all the earth. And this is reaffirmed in Psalms 8, 6. Psalms 8, 6. Jot this down. Psalms 8, 6. Psalm 8, 6 declares, you have made him, that's man, to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. We are, as Elder Ivor reminded us last week, to reign as kings, and for that, kings and priests on this earth. Number six, God gave our speech creative powers. And boy, for some of us, what a mistake. <laughs> but 
this is so important. The spoken word is one of the most powerful things in the universe. It's one of the most powerful forces in the universe. And this comes from God. And he demonstrated this and gave us the example in what he did himself. He spoke the world and everything in it into existence. He said, let there be. Let there be. Light be. Light was. So forth. And we have that ability as demonstrated by God to create and shape our lives and bring things into existence by what we say. We can bring the good things into our existence by what we say and we can bring the negative things by what we say. The tongue is a powerful instrument. As you know, we can speak life or death to a situation or we can set up obstacles for ourselves. And I'll give you the scriptures that spell this out. You already know it. Proverbs 18.21, 18.21 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So we can speak life or death to our situations. And Proverbs 6, Proverbs 6, chapter 2, I mean, uh, verses 2 and 3, Proverbs 6, verses 2 and 3 says, you are snared or trapped by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. And uh, we've gone over this, and I think Elder I review this. When we say things, when we say, you know, you know, I'm a stupid, ignorant mess. You know, you're really defining yourself. And you might say, well, you know, I'm just kidding. But I want to tell you that when you make statements, the subconscious mind starts going to work to make those things come to pass. And I want you to know this if you don't, the subconscious mind can't take a joke. It doesn't know that you're not, that you're not being straightforward. It doesn't know that you're joking and so forth. So don't be loose with the mouth and so forth. Uh, you remember years ago, Flip Wilson used to say, what you see is what you get. Some of us who are older, well, it's not really that. It's what you say is what you get. Now, our seventh point is that God gave us ability to name things. And this is one gift that you never hear about. But I think it's a really powerful tool. And, go, and, and I want you to see this for yourself. Go to Genesis chapter 2 and look at verse 19. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Here at Genesis 2, verse 19, we find this recorded. Out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. In other words, if Adam named a four-legged animal dog, that's what it became. It became dog. Well, I don't see anywhere in the Bible throughout where this God-given ability to name things was ever taken away. It's an important tool that we can use. And let me show you how you can use it. If you have a situation in your life that you have been calling bad or negative, such as a job loss, such as a downsizing in a job, such as a physical challenge, such as a relationship problem, a divorce, a separation, or a breakup, or a relationship problem within the family, Instead of calling it horrible or bad, name it good, call it good, and unto you, that's what it'll become. It'll become good unto you. Now, what I mean by that, instead of the situation being called by you as bad, horrible, and, you know, only a miracle would save me, <laughs> instead of it being a setback, just say this is a stepping stone. This is my opportunity to grow through this experience and go on to the next opportunity or the next level of development and advancement. It's an opportunity. Instead of an obstacle, make it a stepping stone. You call it a stepping stone, not an obstacle. This is, I, in fact, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say this, but uh, if you have, if you've heard anybody say this, raise your hands. I said it before a few years ago. Anyway, I think it's an important gift that is overlooked. Number eight, God gave us free will. Another big mistake. No, sorry. I started to say another big mistake. No, no. <laughs> big mistake for Adam. 
But God gave us free will and the ability to make choices. Because of this free will, life is choice driven. And our, life, and our lives are shaped by the choices we make. And you see this every day in your own life. Your life is shaped by the choices you make. And you have to choose wisely. Remember what Joshua said in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15? Write it down, Joshua 24, verse 15. And you can write in parentheses choices. You can look at it later. Joshua 24, 15. He says this, and if it seems evil in, your, in you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have a, you have a choice uh, as to whether you serve the Lord or not. Choice is set forth again by God in Deuteronomy 30, 19. Very familiar verse. Deuteronomy 30, 19. You can write it down and look at it again. You know it. Here at verse 19 in Deuteronomy 30, he says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. That's Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Choose life. And... We need to always choose life and choose to follow God's word. And as Psalm 119, 105, you know what it says. We not, may not remember. It comes from here. And I, I said it in my opening prayer. Psalm 119, 105 declares. I want you to make sure you get it. It's Psalm 119, 105 declares. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's your guide. The word is your guide. Yeah, I mean, his word is your guide. Now, number nine, this is an important one. We can declare the end from the beginning as God does. As we make plans in life, set goals, establish direction, plan projects, and look out on our future, we can see the end game or where we want to be at the beginning. We have that ability. So if you want to end up, for example, if you're trying to sign up 40,000 people on your internet net site, then see yourself making the announcement that I have number 40,000 today. Visualize it. It's so important. Uh, here's what God does. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. I want you to write it down because this is a good one to remember. It records this. Remember the former things of old. This is God speaking. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. And verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. So it's important to see and visualize success and completion of goals at the beginning because this helps us to focus and helps us bring about the desired results. And let me give you those five steps right here. I just jotted them down uh, upstairs this morning because I think I've given these to you before and you've heard them from other teachers. Visualization is one of them. But if you want uh, you, you understand the creative process in accomplishing a goal, it starts with conceptualizing in other words, where you conceive the idea. Two, you internalize it. Conceptualize, internalize. Internalize is when you believe it in your heart. Like a Mark, Mark 11, 24 tells us, believe it in your heart. Three, you verbalize it. You speak it. Very important that you speak it. Now you're saying, well, do I get up out on the street corner or on a platform? No, you can say it to yourself. Speak it to yourself. Speak it to somebody you trust. Conceptualize, internalize, verbalize, and then for visualize, the one that we're just talking about. You visualize it, you actually see it. And if you don't know this, let me tell you, if you can't see it, you can't have it. You have to be able to visualize it and you have that ability to do so. And after you do those four, the final step is materialize. It appears on the material plane uh, and so forth. Conceptualize, internalize, verbalize, visualize, materialize. Number 10, 
God has given us his word, which is his will. And it's in this book, the Bible. God's word is truth. And by knowing and living this truth, we are made free. That is free from bondage of sin, separation from God, and freedom from the control of our lives by the prince of this world, Satan. In John 17, 17, you can write it down, John 17, 17, Jesus declares, John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. And earlier in the Gospel of John, that's John at chapter 31, verse 32. John 31, 32, jot it down. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. God's word is truth, and he has given this word and truth to us. Now, God's desire for his people has always been for us to know and do his word. In Hosea 4, 6, you know this, but you can write it down. God declares, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is a lack of knowledge of his word. And part of the redemptive plan for man through Jesus was for Jesus to call attention to and teach us God's word. It has always been the, the, mission, the mission of Apostle Price, and I've been there from the beginning, to teach us God's word and push us to learn the word ourselves and to be doers of this word and not hearers only. This teaching of the word goes forth from this pulpit anytime anyone stands here, whether minister, elder, or visiting teacher who's here to present the word. That is the basis of today's message that I'm talking about on within dependence and the radiance of transcendence. It is the fact that God has endowed us with this transcendence and it's based on the word, based on what we find in the word. It is facts from the word. So if you receive and acted on the word that God has already deposited within you and everything that you could ever need in the way of power and resources that's within you, would you not be free indeed would you not be free indeed and live a victorious overcoming life? If you believed what we're just teaching and have been teaching and you acted on it, you would be free. You would be free indeed. Now remember, God's word for him is the supreme thing. And you need to see this one, Psalm 138.2. Jot it down. You can look at it if you have time. And the reason I'm going, because I wanted to finish this segment today, because there's a lot to this teaching, and I wanted to, I don't mean to rush you, but, but I want you to, to, to get the scriptures, and you can go back, get the tape, and then you can uh, read the scriptures again on yourself. Psalm 138, verse 2. David reminds us of the supremacy of God's word, and he writes this. He says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. God magnifies his word above his name. That's how supreme the word is. And Jesus declares in Matthew 24, 35, Matthew 24, 35, and this won't be the, the only time that I'll go over these things, but I just wanted to give you this summary today. In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So in this ministry here, right here, founded by Apostle Frederick Casey Price, we agree with God. Isn't that something? We agree with God. That his word is supreme and that people should not perish for a lack of knowledge of his word. That is why we proudly call Crenshaw Christian Center New York a word church. We are a word church, and that is why you will always get the word here. So for our peace of mind, God gives us a final note of assurance regarding his word. And you can take a look at this. You know the scripture, Isaiah 26.3. That's 11. That's point 11, by the way. Point 11 is God provides us access to perfect peace. Number 11, God provides us access to perfect peace. In Isaiah 26, 3, we find this assurance. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Let's go back and, and reread it. 
You, that's God, will keep him, that's us, in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, that's God. So how do you keep your mind stayed on God? By keeping your mind stayed on his word. God and his word, one and the same. God and his word. Do you keep your mind stayed on the word and he'll keep you in perfect peace? Now, 12th point. Had to have at least 12 points. 12th point is so important for us, obviously, because this is what makes everything else possible. God sent his son Jesus to save and redeem us. Number 12, God sent his son Jesus to save and redeem us. John 3, 16, you can write it down, but you know it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And we learned two attributes of God right there that we should manifest giving and loving. He gave, he loved, and he gave. Two attributes that we should possess and act on. So we see that in these 12 points that I just went over quickly, and perhaps too quickly, but you can get the tape. It's just a partial description of what we have uh, in God who resides within us. Next week we'll discuss what we have from the Son and the Holy Spirit who also reside within us. But based on what I've gone over today, talking about God's love, God's light, God's uh, spirit, God's presence within us, and God's power, you can see where we come up with this little affirmation, which I've given to you before. And we're going to end on this. Based on what you've heard today about spirit, about love, about his power and by his presence within us. This is where this comes from. I'm going to read it and I'm going to have you recite it. It says, I am surrounded by God's light, enfolded in God's love, protected by God's power, and watched over by God's presence because wherever I am, God is. Now I want you to repeat it for yourself. I am surrounded by God's light, <laughs> enfolded in God's love, Protected by, God's power, protected by God's power, watched over by God's presence, watched over by God's presence because wherever I, am, because wherever I am, God is. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, BrentshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving the second time is even easier. Simply text EASTG to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight.